Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please be seated. Temptations in the wilderness. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. That wasn't the only time of his temptations. The devil was after him at least through all of his public ministry. Uh, even at the very beginning when uh, uh, they had gone away and Jesus had uh, asked his disciples, you know, well, what's the scuttlebutt out there? You know, who, what do people say that I am? Who am I? And they gave, you know, some say he's Elijah, some say he's John risen from the dead, so forth, so on. And he says, well, and then he asked him the key question, which is, whom do you say that I am? And Peter stood up and spoke for the disciples and said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one of God, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, you have spoken correctly. God has given you this. And then he began to say that what his, their objective is, is that he has gone his way eventually to Jerusalem to die and on the third day rise again. And like a lot of bad news, uh, Peter and the disciples that only heard were going to Jerusalem to die. They didn't hear the other two things. And so Peter then stands up and says, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. That's, that's not the agenda here. Uh, uh, you, you, you can't die. So you, you're... To go with David, and, and you're to go and to take the throne of David and, and rule over Israel uh, as King David did. And Jesus said, Satan, get behind me. And until his death on the cross, Satan never stopped trying to tempt Jesus. But Jesus was holy and perfect, and he had no sin, so he did not sin. But we're not, and we are also uh, subject to the powers of the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh. We are subject to that. And, and the whole totality of Scripture is a story of God's people. God created Adam and Eve, and then very, they brought sin into the world, thanks to the Satan who deceived them. Who, and, and we need to study his methodology so that we understand how he tempts us to disobey God. And then we go through the scriptures till we get to the time of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Joseph leads them into Egypt, uh, or they come to Egypt because Joseph has got food, and they're there for 400 years, that's four zero times 10, and then they, uh, uh, they're crying to the Lord because they're in slavery in Egypt, and God says, okay, I'm going to send you Moses, and he's going to lead you to the promised land. And Moses goes, 80-year-old man, and leads them out of Egypt into the promised land. But they are a little recalcitrant in this and complaining and griping and sinning against God and Moses and everybody else. And uh, I, God says, it's going to take you 40 years to get to the promised land. And uh, for those of you who were here last week, was it last week or Thursday? And, and the mistake that I made uh, in saying that that uh, Joshua was the only one over 20 years of age who left Egypt to uh, enter the promised land, uh, another one of those brain cramps. And uh, actually, I'd left out Caleb, who was the other spy with Joshua who had scouted out the promised land. And uh, only of the 12 spies, uh, Joshua and Caleb, were the only ones who came back. It's beautiful. They're huge. They're plentiful and everything, and God will lead us against those giants in battle. And the rest of them said, oh, forget it. We'll just stay out here in the wilderness. We're never going to conquer those guys. So Joshua and Caleb. Was Joshua did. All right. And then, and then Moses gave them his swan song. And, and all of that was to, to remind them that, that if you're going into the promised land, here's how you're going to live there. Here's what God, how he's going to enable you to do that. And, and, of course, they fail uh, because they're sinful people. 
and they go from there and so forth till finally all of the Old Testament was fulfilled in Jesus. And he's come. And that's what we've heard. We heard at the beginning at, at, uh, at, at Christmas, the child that was born. And then we, we studied about and saw how that child that was born in Epiphany is the, the, uh, uh, the Messiah, the Son of God in the flesh. And, and then he came and he lived. And we heard uh, in the Epiphany the manifestations of who he and what he was, that he wasn't just a baby and a regular person. He was God himself in the flesh. And then uh, now that we're entering uh, another phase in his life as we're focusing on uh, his journey to Jerusalem, that he might complete his task and die for the sins of the world. And then he uh, uh, sent his uh, now disciples off as apostles into the world, and all that they were not quite ready yet. But then he ascended into heaven. And then finally, uh, 50 days later, the Holy Spirit comes and sends them out first into the marketplace of Jerusalem and beyond to the known area of the world so that it had all been completed. And then after the gospel lessons we have in the scriptures, all New Testament, we have the impact of, of the, the Holy Spirit and those apostles on the world. That's what we have today for the scriptures. It's all an example. It's an object lesson for us. Because each one of us is born from near perfection into the wilderness of life. That's where we are now. It's a longer journey for some than others. Some don't ever make it into the world alive, either because a spontaneous uh, abortion or uh, brought on by man. Uh, God has uh, incredible uh, design capabilities in, in these human bodies that we have. In spite of sin, they're still functioning quite well. But he's given us instructions as how we live in this wilderness. Because with his people of Israel, whenever they forgot the house rules, he let them be taken out of the house to think about what they were messing up so that they were eager, some of them, to come back home to Jerusalem. Well, see, God does the same thing to us in life. Particularly those of us who are born into a Christian family and have been blessed by being baptized at, at, as an infant or quite young and, and then growing up under the instruction of, of the scriptures and, and then being confirmed in it and, and continuing on in, in life. And, and, but we need, it, it's a cruel world out there. Again, but the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh are trying to lead us still constantly away from, from Jesus. And that's what, you know, so, uh, uh, so God gives us instructions. He says, uh, you're my people. As he said uh, through the epistle today, through to uh, the writer to Romans. As far as God's concerned, there is no differentiation. In Christianity, there is no racism because we're all the same before God. There's no gender, there's no race, there's no, well, there is creed differentiation. God's very particular. There's only one creed. But that's the way God set it forth. He says, now tell everybody there's only one way. And we're all on a journey. God wants us all to be on the journey to the promised land. Except it's not here. It's in heaven. And we got, he wants us to, to work that. But it's to, you got to know how the devil works. Because he's been using the same tactics since he used them on Adam and Eve in the Garden of Gethsemane. We get an insight into it now with today's gospel. As these weren't the only three temptations of Jesus in the wilderness. He was being tempted the whole time. But now we have, we have these three. And first off, when you compare the synoptic gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they all talk about these temptation, temptations in the wilderness. But see, the first thing that, that we confront is people who are searching for reasons to not believe the Scriptures. 
They find discrepancies in this very text. They contradict each other because they all don't have the same order of the temptations. Therefore, the scriptures are in error, which is their point. Is it? Of course not. Let's take a look at the order that we have today. It, it, it varies. I won't go into the difference. Let's just look at what we have here from Luke. From Luke. It's, you know, I just used it before. What tempts us in life? The devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh. That's the order of temptation in reverse in Luke. He first attacked Jesus in his own flesh. After 40 days, he was hungry. It's not that unusual for someone to survive 40 days without food as long as he has water to keep the, the body hydrated. But at the end of that 40 days, you better get something into him or he, he may not last much longer. Jesus was hungry. And, and, and Satan comes. First place, what's it? Satan, Lucifer, Beelzebub, the liar, the deceiver, the, that's what that all means. And, and look at the way he begins his temptation to Jesus. He says, what? In all three of them, what's the first word? If. If you are the Son of God, do this. And then what he did, is, and it's easier to start on, on, our, on, on the persons, on our own sinful flesh. In fact, that's what we have to deal with in life mostly. The world is, you know, you can cut yourself off of the world. You can, you know, a mighty fortress is our God, and you can retreat to his fortress most of the time. And the devil... He's got so many helpers, <laughs> both among the angelic uh, evil angels and amongst people that uh, uh, it's, you know, he doesn't have to work on you guys. He works on the televangelists. Boy, has he been successful there. And uh, other people who are uh, publicly uh, in for Christ Jesus and, and, uh, and for the Christian faith. I mean, it's, uh, it's risky today in our, in our political situation, in our political correctness. You just can't. Well, anyway, back to, he says to Jesus, turn this stone into bread. No big deal. You got the power. If you're the son, you do it. Fix it. Yeah. Well, he's, it's for us. That's a, he comes at us too. He says, it's no big deal. You have the power to do these things for yourselves. Nobody's going to know. God gives you forgiveness. Just go do it. Eat the extra dessert. <laughs> Nobody really cares if you go 10 or 11 miles over the speed limit, except the people that are trying to maintain precisely not over the speed limit, and they just better get out of the way or they're going to get totally run over. You know, so uh, nobody cares. God doesn't really care whether you do a little, uh, you know, so it's, it's okay. And on and on, all the, you know, I, I, <laughs> in my crazy moments, I almost uh, 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 toyed with the idea of asking you, what's your favorite excuse? <laughs> but I, I don't. You can tell me later, but don't. Uh, it probably wouldn't take more than one or two or three. And we said, yeah, me too, me too, me too, me too. That's kind of popular these days, okay? And so it was, but Jesus wasn't even tempted. No. Why? Because he had the word of God in his consciousness, in his vocabulary, in his heart, and in his mouth. It was, in fact, <laughs> it was so bad, he was the Word of God in the flesh. So he said, man does not live by bread alone. He'd just proven it for 40 days. And I can wait a little bit longer. I don't need you. 
Now, I've seen, you know, a lot of kids, including myself, that I hardly can get home from school before I'm starved to death. But 40 days, it was not a temptation because he was without sin. And so he maintained his 40-day fast. By the way, that's the way, that's the, that's the foundation for the tradition of the church often has been that you, uh, you give up something, uh, usually in fasting kind of a mode, so you give up, say, ice cream for Lent, and then what you would have normally have spent for that, then you make a special Lenten offering to God, uh, to the church, uh, for, for that stuff, you know, and it's whatever. It's, it's not a mandatory kind of thing, but it was, it was a good practice to remind you that we're in the season of rent. Rent, rent. But Jesus didn't. Uh, you know, he didn't fall to that. And then the next thing is, first was the, the flesh and then the, uh, uh, the world. And, and he takes him high up and he shows him the world. And he says, you know, if you bow and worship to me, I will give you the glory of the world to you. This has been, this has been declared to me. It's been turned over to me. And, 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 uh, uh, and Jesus says, <laughs> you know, to the, uh, uh, you know, worship the Lord and him only. Yeah. It's kind of basically the, the, the main part of the first commandment. No other gods and uh, use his name properly and worship him. So that's, you know, that's so it's saying. So it's not all that glory. Besides with, and he says that uh, showed him all the kingdoms and authority and their glory that had been delivered to Satan. Delivered to him by whom? Not by God. You know who delivered the world to him? Adam. Adam delivered the world to him by becoming his slave in sin, Adam turned over the world to Satan. And Satan's advocates throughout history have worked hard at destroying people and destroying the world, rather than being loving servants of people and stewarding the world properly. And Jesus said, yeah, no, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the third part is down to the devil's part. And he takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple, which was known that, that, that there was rumors that the Messiah, when he came, he could do this, that he could jump off and it wouldn't hurt anything. And he says, if you're the son of a God, fulfill the, the prophecies and, and jump off of here. And, and quoting from the, from the uh, uh, psalm in the intro today, he says he will send his angels to care. In fact, did you see what his, his quote uh, take a look at it while you look at the intro. And it says, uh, uh, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they, uh, they will bear you up. Now go back and look at the... Uh, uh, see, because this is the other thing that, that the Satan does. He quotes Scripture, but he misquotes Scripture. You go back to the intro, and it says the second series there, uh, uh, you have been a dwelling place. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come to your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now to what got left out. Are you reading it? Concerning you, what? To guard you in all your ways. To guard you in all your ways. Yeah. The devil left that out. He didn't want Jesus to remember as if he could forget that the purpose of angels is to help to God, God's instruments in guarding us so that we don't do dumb and stupid things. That we don't take chances with this precious gift of life and limb that God has given to us. And and. Satan went right for those kinds of things because what was he offering for that? And he says, uh, God will protect you. Yeah. It was, you know, and, and 
And what a great thing that would have been if Jesus had done it. Because it was right there where everybody could see him. And immediately he would be recognized as the Messiah by someone besides just the demons. He would be recognized as the Messiah because he's done this great flotation thing as he guided down and didn't splatter at the bottom of the 600-foot uh, pinnacle of the temple. See, Satan, the great deceiver, he will twist things. He will warp things. He will, and we fall to it all the time because it's personally advantageous either because it meets my desires for the moment. Why do you think there's so much substance abuse this day? It's because they're looking for peace, tranquility, nirvana. And it only lasts a little bit less time than it did the last time I used that much. Because that's the way the devil works. He rewards you immediately, but not for long. And, and we fall to so much temptation. And boy, it's getting stronger these days. It's there. Now that everyone has access to the Internet. And it takes our children to get, take about that long to get around as nanny guard stuff. Right? I mean, I get in trouble, I call my grandson, says, okay, fix it. My son-in-law didn't have time. Okay. <laughs> but but the, the, the kids know how to work that stuff. The kids know how to... St what chance do they have? No more chance than anybody else. Why? Because Jesus beat the devil. On the cross, when he said, it is finished, he put the shackles back on the devil. He put the shackles back on the devil. So we don't need to fear the devil or the world or our own sinful flesh. We need to respect it by knowing that it's there, knowing that at any moment it can overtake us with deception. But we don't have to be afraid of it. Because in baptism, God gives us His Holy Spirit. He gives us His Word. He gives us His sacraments. And all of those kind of things are what we have to beat the devil. And what did the third, how much is it going to take to scatter the devil away? You heard what Jesus said to Peter when he was acting like the devil. He says, get behind me, Satan. And as, if you just need one word, it's Jesus. Devil be gone. Jesus said that to Peter. You can say that to some of your enemies, to some of your co-workers, to some of your classmates, to some of your family members. But you don't say that to them to ban them. You say that to them to bring them back to the confession that Jesus is the Christ the Son of the living God. Because that's the focus. That's the focus of Lent, Epiphany, the whole church here, our whole lives in the wilderness. Because the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh are always with us. You can't hide from it. All. But as you read and study the scriptures, to read, mark, and inwardly digest it, so digest it so that out of your heart and out of your mouth can come the scriptures. You have to, by God's grace, get it in there before it can come out. But a little bit of studying on a daily basis. People who do daily devotions are amazed at how many days they're able to use the very words they had that morning in devotions in witnessing to somebody that day. If you don't believe that, try it. I dare you. Try it. For a week. And if nothing happens, try another week. 
Oh, I'm not going to give you an excuse. <laughs> I can't hear you. Probably a good thing. <laughs> All right. God loves us. Jesus has completed both his active obedience and his passive obedience. He actively repelled the devil. He passively went through his suffering and death. His accomplishment of both active and passive obedience to God, his Father, did it also for us. We don't have to do anything in order to receive forgiveness of sins and life salvation. God gives it to us as a gift. But he gives us the word and the sacraments. But he says, here's how life can be in the wilderness for you. This is how peace comes to us. It's yours. I want you to be at peace with the, with the devil, the world, and your own sinful flesh. They lost the battle. And when the war is over, they will be utterly, totally, completely destroyed and kept away from you from eternity. So this is only a little bit. It's over. But we're still wandering in the desert. And read about God's people wandering in the desert throughout scriptures. It was a renewing moment for them that brought them closer back to the love of God and the worship of Him and seeking of their sins, forgiveness. And we know this is all true because, hallelujah, Christ is risen. <laughs> <laughs>